Hey y'all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to episode two of the No-Till Market Garden podcast. Super excited about today's episode. I got on the horn with Alex Eakins of Ace of Spades Farm in Spokane, Washington, and Alex gives us a really detailed breakdown of the operation he runs there with his partner, Amy, of bed prep, bed flipping, and no-till farming in general. Before we get into that, make sure that you leave a review and subscribe to this podcast wherever you are getting it. Hopefully you are getting it wherever you usually get your podcasts. But if not, you should be able to soon. Apparently, these things take time. Uh, yeah. Also, check out the Patreon page. If this podcast is adding some amount of value to your life, any amount of value, uh, or you just want me to improve the audio and buy some better equipment, consider kicking in a couple bucks a month. No pressure, but, you know, it is a really quick way to be super awesome. Just saying. All right, uh, enough rambling from me. We got a no-till grower to talk to. So, let's do it. Alex Eakins of Ace of Spades Farm. Alex Eakins, welcome to the podcast, ma'am. Hey, good to be here. I'm glad to talk to you. Yeah, so maybe we could start with you just giving us a little idea of how much land is under cultivation there at Ace of Spades and what kind of crops you all specialize in and maybe even just marketing and distribution, generally speaking. Yeah, so uh, my name is Alex Deakins. I'm the founder and co-owner of Ace of Spades Farm. Uh, I'm a partner with Amy Dolomont. She's my farm partner and partner in life. Uh, we're located in Spokane, Washington. Uh, that's Stern, Washington. Uh, we're up at the 47th parallel, kind of an hour or so below Canada. Um, we cultivate gourmet and specialty produce. So we grow for chefs and professional home alike. Um, we sell to a number of the local hotels and resorts. And we also focus on selling to what I would consider fine, finer dining in Spokane or smaller restaurants that focus and cater to local food. Um, we also sell to three different grocers, um, and those are all of actually varying different sizes. So one's a mom and pop, the other is a co-op, and the other is the natural food store that's owned by the larger grocer conglomerate in the area. Um, we grow heirloom tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, squash, Cucumbers, beans, potatoes, radish, turnips, carrots, lettuce, kale, spinach, arugula, mustard greens, chard, microgreens, and we do a fair bit of edible flowers as well. Um, we're sort of known for growing produce to specific sizes and forms. And so we like to say that it's about the flavor, the beauty, and the health of the vegetables that we grow. Um, so a couple of things that are unique about our farm is that we're located only four miles from downtown Spokane. Uh, we live in a very rural area um, that is only four miles from the second largest city in Washington State. So we're really blessed to be able to live uh, the rural lifestyle, but also just to jump away from uh, the heart of the city. So we only cultivate about 15,000 square feet of bed. So we have the standard 30-inch by 100-foot long bed, uh, and we have about 70 of those. Um, so it's, it's a quarter of an acre, um, and we have, say, one acre behind a 12-foot deer fence. So we've basically just fenced off an acre, and inside of that we've cultivated a quarter of it. Um, and so we've got one-foot halves between essentially a plot of 60 beds, and then we have another plot that's a set of uh, 15 um, beds. And um, so it's an extremely compact farm. Um, we don't have large pathways um, because we don't use any tractors on our farm. Everything is done just by the two of us, essentially 
by hand with some appropriate technology. So um, we have a wash and pack house. We have another uh, double-sided walk-in cooler. And we have two farmer friends, caterpillar tunnels, that we grow are what we call hot crops in. So your tomatoes and eggplant peppers. Um, everything else is done in the field. Everything is direct seeded. So we only transplant the hot crops. We do not transplant any other plants on the farm. And I can talk more about why we've made that decision. But um, we use no synthetics, no herbicides, no pesticides, no GMO, organic or not or otherwise. So no chemicals. Um, we use no tractors or tillage. We're the only labor on the farm. We mainly use hand tools and hand harvest. Um, we approach everything from a lean technology approach. Um, that's something that I had also learned from a previous project. Um, and so we sort of apply a radical approach to farming where we believe in growing better food, not more food. Um, we focus on an Albrecht theory of mineral balancing, and we use microbiology to amplify the living soil food web. And uh, it's an ecological approach to farming. Um, this is the end of our fourth season. So I moved back to the family land. The property is originally my great-grandfather's is where I grew up. And I moved back in 2014 with the intention of starting the farm. Um, and uh, so we kind of sum all of that up with Elliot Coleman term, which is deep organic farming. So we are not a certified organic farm, but uh, we consider ourselves to be a, a deep organic farm. Um, so that's kind of who we are and, and what we do um, in terms of, say, like finance. Um, we are, are a debt-free farm, and we earn profit as farmers. So we, we firmly do believe in, in building smart and taking on appropriate amounts of debt to leverage, you know, the, the right kinds of investments with known returns so as to always be able to know that your farm is paying its own way. Um, I think that's kind of like a, a bootstrap approach to our farm, but it has definitely gotten us now to a place going into our fifth year where we have all of the tools and the technology that we feel that we need to do the amount that we did the previous year and more, and in looking in terms of always trying to find the most efficiency out of the space we currently have before we add anything else, I, I already know there's additional gains to be had. Um, and so, you know, this, this season we've sold close to $65,000 $65, worth of, of product um, in about 20, 20 weeks. Um, our season runs May, May 15th to about now, uh, October 15th or so. It's been a really nice fall. But, um, that's kind of where we're at. So what were you doing before 2014 then? <laughs> um, I was a, a, a partner in the development of Scratch and Tech Seeds. Um, it's, it was the first certified organic, verified non-GMO livestock company in North America that, that started in Bellingham, Washington in 2010, 2011. Um, and so we, we sort of were at the forefront of, of reinventing the small county mill to buy direct grain directly from farmers to uh, create a, a non-cooked um, whole grain feed, primarily for chickens, so that the people could have a high quality organic feed for their for their flock, so that the quality of the egg and the quality of the bird coming off of a of a flock would would actually be represented above the values that most people would want to be able to feed their their chickens with, and it also put more money right back in the pocket of of Washington State grain farmers because they were growing for us. Um, we, we basically had contracts with barley and oats and wheat growers, um, feed growers, corn growers. So, you know, we supported certified organic corn. Um, it was supply free. Um, yeah, that's what we were doing. And, and then, um, along that process, 
uh, took off on lean manufacturing. Um, I went to a company called Kaizen. Um, Kaizen is a, a lean manufacturing training company. Um, and so we applied lean uh, manufacturing to special tech keys, and that's where I was first trained in lean manufacturing in 2012. Um, and, you know, like always in the back of my mind as approaching the farm, it was just kind of new and ever present and exciting because I had seen the results of, of what taking a, a what you think is a well thought functioning manufacturing facility and, and realizing just what you could take. And so, you know, we were we nearly dropped our inventory to nothing and our cash flow was through the roof and we were making actually what people wanted and not spending our time making the things that they didn't want and, you know, everything just it, it really blew up. Um, so I, I did that for for the five years or so and, and after just dealing directly with all of these producers, um, animal producers, at that point in time, I just had gleaned all this information from them and um, I had made the choice at that time to live in a an ostrich cabin um, south of Bellingham. So I lived in a, in a cabin in the woods um, without electricity for two and a half years while running that feed operation in the city. And so, I, it, you know, I had my permaculture design certificate and, you know, that was my path in. And previous before that, I had been running restaurants and so I had come smack, you know, for, forefront right into my space about what local food is and why that mattered and what was coming off the truck craft. And, you know, so I, I went from purchasing local food to creating a value-added directly grown food products for food producers and then, you know, just realized the the access to land and my knowledge base and and everything was sort of there for me to make the jump to move back to where I was from to start a, a vegetable farm. How did you end up in no-till? I mean, was it a product of the lean manufacturing when you started to look at what reducing the amount of stuff you used? Or was that a product of the permaculture design? How did that come about? Okay, so I guess what, what happened for me was that no-till was always present in terms of, like, the lasagna garden techniques of permaculture, right? Like, stacking carbon, stacking compost, making layers. Um, the Toby Hemingway, you know, idea of, of how to build soil on on concrete. Um, but it never seems practical from a farming approach, right? It was like, well, I'm not going to go out here and lay cardboard down over a quarter of an acre. Like, that just was never going to really happen. And so it just kind of seems more like um, a gardening technique rather than a, a farming technique. And so when I first moved back to Spokane, it was at the end of a really dry period. So there was traditionally a pond in the in the field. We are 40 acres there, and, and traditionally in the pond, you know, would be there until June or so, and that was a, a part of my childhood remembering the pond. But when I came back, there hadn't been a pond for a long time, and we were starting to Maybe they're looking on there. So when I first cultivated the area, it included a part of this sort of lower line patch. And and at that time, I had hired a guy to come over and to fill, to turn back the sod. And so, you know, that that property had never been tilled in all of human history. Um, and at that point in time, uh, you know, the, the tarping methodology wasn't really as ever present as it was, you know, a few years later than that, um, when, when like, J.M. and Curtis Stone made a big deal of it, and, and it became, you know, clear that that was, like, a, a real easy tool to turn new ground on, and we've since used our just to turn new ground, but, um, you know, I, I first tilled, and what I saw as a result of tilling just sort of never looked right. And so that first season in 2014, I used uh, a rototiller on the farm. It was a, a 1979 Aaron's rototiller that had been on the property since I was a kid. And this was just like an old school rototiller. And it, and it did the job, but it just, the soil by summertime looked, just looked unhappy. I don't know really how to describe it, but it, it didn't look like I wanted it. It didn't look still. It wasn't like that soil that you 
think of, right? And and I have beautiful soil here on this property. It's a, a hardesty loam. It's a unique kind of clay loam that goes through this big swing throughout the where early spring, I guess what I'm getting at is there was a dry period and now it's a very wet period. And so in early spring, the hardesty loam is, is just kind of like soup. It just sort of sits there and holds a lot of And so as a result of, say, having tilled going into that second year of spring, I realized that the tilling was not going to be something that was going to be beneficial to me or even really possible. And so I needed to come up with a strategy that would be as if I had had an early spring till on my farm without doing it because I wasn't going to be able to get out onto my land until it was dry enough. And so this is a lot of where, like, my winter gardening techniques and overwintering also come into play because early spring on our farm is very... And so it really came out of how do I get into the ground? How do I not create big, muddy clumps? And how do I function early on when there's this flush of weeds that comes from having exposed soil uh, filled soil all went off. And so it basically just came very clear that we needed to not be using the rototiller to to go through these processes. And so it really was just like that lean approach of just cutting out the flag and asking yourself why and always just looking at what you're doing and questioning yourself because it just didn't seem right. I knew it was too much work. The results weren't what I wanted. And there had to be a better one. Um, and, you know, like, specifically, like, even with, like, the terminology and all that really crept in for me, like, I can't honestly say. It just always was the direction that I was told, and it always just worked better and was, was more efficient for me um, in, in my context. And I think that it became the most clear when, when we reached that point, when, when the crux of all of this no-till versus till really comes to life. And, and there's this specific moment where you've harvested a crop and the crop is done. And you want to go back into that same spot. And that's that moment. That's the moment where all of this happens. It's like the reason why a tractor exists. It's the, it's the reason why, you know, it, it, it's the reason why. And so it's what do you do in that moment? What do we do with the organic matter that exists above ground? And what do you do with the root matter that exists below ground? And how do you get from that point to the end point that you want? And anytime I talk about this, it's always like, what are you going to achieve in that moment? And, and there's a lot of dialogue to talk about what happens. Right, because it's like every kind of farming then follows from that moment. You either kill, right, or you use herbicides to kill it back, or you graze animals on it, or you just only clear the surface matter, which is what we started to do, um, or say you carp it, or you flail mow it, or you uh, power harrow it. Right, you have all of these things available to you, but it's it's always just like, what's your goal? Where are you trying to get to next? And and uh, I think that that's sort of like the, the moment that is most interesting to me and, and, and probably the one that turned me towards no kill. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a good segue into talking very specifically about how you, uh, how you operate a no-till bed. So maybe we could do, maybe we could just start in the spring and you could tell me what a garden bed looks like uh, before a crop goes in, and then what you do to prepare so, it? Um, the whole point of this is a step-by-step process for you to go from one place to another place, from a bed that you've grown in to planting back in that bed. And so for us, we don't plant. Um, now, some people may actually find a system like this works very well with transplanting because you're not trying to create that very clean, perfect seed bed like we do to run 
our seed. So the first thing is root crops are are the perfect crop for no-till because you remove the entire plant when you harvest, right? So it deals with the entire plant in the bed in and of itself. So root crops are sort of a category in their own, which is that I would hand harvest my root crop. I would remove all of the remaining residue from the bed with a rake. You take it to a compost pile. So I use a, a bed prep rake and a wheelbarrow, and I put the residue from the bed into the wheelbarrow, and I take it to my pump. And the next step is that I broad fork our bed, and I use a Johnny's large hard pan broad fork to do that, and I make one pass broad forking on the bed. After I broad fork the bed, I apply the amendment to our bed, so that depends upon your soil test, and what you believe the correct recommendation is for your bed, and I apply that um, by weight, by hand, with a five-gallon bucket, so the same weight goes into each bed, and I just sprinkle that out by hand, uh, evenly over the bed, and then I make a single pass with that same bed prep rake to lightly rake in the amendment, and then I cover that bed with one inch of compost or sphagnum peat moss or a combination of compost and sphagnum peat moss, depending upon where I'm trying to take the bed to. And then I lightly rake down the bed with the bed prep rake one more time. And then you have a perfectly clean, untilled, amended, smooth seed bed for you to seed or, if you prefer, to transplant into. So for me, root crops are butter. It's easy peasy, right? It's great to follow uh, root crops with your baby greens because you've had this whole round of root crops. They carrot that they're there for 70, 80 days. You have a whole round of carrot that you've precision weeded, that you hand weeded, that you harvested off, that you cleared the entire bed, and you're ready to go. It would be nearly weed free. Um, so I love I love going in root crop and falling with with non root crop. So say if it's a a non root crop. So imagine that I have a bed of arugula in the ground. So the first step is that I would take the, after harvesting, I'm ready to be done with that bed, I would take either a hand knife, a quick cut harvester, you can use a size or what I've been trialing now, it's going to seem strange, but it has amazing functionality so far, is a spin trimmer with a rigid metal blade. And just so we're clear, uh, spin trimmer is just a nice way of saying weed whacker. And with any of these cutting tools, you want to cut right at the soil surface. So you're essentially attempting to terminate the life of the plant by cutting below the crown. So you're severing the, the vegetative part of the plant from the root part of the plant. But you're leaving the root intact in your soil. And so that's, that's important. Because what you're doing is you're, you're visualizing that there's a difference between the organic matter, the remaining vegetative matter above soil surface, and the soil itself. So often what we as humans have seemed to do is think that the only way to get rid of what's above the ground is to mix it with the ground. And I believe that it's far more efficient to spend your time merely removing the remaining above ground debris and taking that to your compost pot. Um, so after you have cut back all of the organic matter above the ground, I rake it, put it in the wheelbarrow, take it to the compost pile. The next step is to broad fork, amend, cover with compost, rake smooth, and there you have it. You have a clean seed bed ready to seed or transplant into. Um, and that's it. 
that's how we go from, from one bed to the next. Um, it's a series of steps, one after another, always easily repeatable. Um, and I can go into why I think that those steps are important, but those are the steps um, as far as I'm concerned for what I consider to be a no-till process. Um, and so for me, that no-till process doesn't mean that you don't cultivate, and it doesn't mean that you have to have living matter or living ground cover in the beds or in the path because we have essentially weed-free, clean beds um, at seeding time, and then we have fully covered beds with plants that we want for the duration of that they're there, and there's only a period of time where that bed is, is say, bare, but covered in compost. Um, and so for us, we, we feel like that's, that's the most straightforward, most efficient means of what I'll say is organic no-till or ecological no-till um, that doesn't use a rototiller, it doesn't use a tractor, it doesn't even use a filter. The only mechanical aspect that I've added now at this point is, is using a, a spin trimmer with a rigid blade uh, on the end. Are you making all of the com- your own compost, or are you ordering that in some, from somewhere? Well, and so um, this next year, we're going to have more of an emphasis on making our, our own compost because of the amount of organic matter that we do take off of a bed. You know, when you clear, say, like a bed of baby kale or something, when you're, you've taken your two cuts, maybe you've, you know, managed to get a, a decent third cut, maybe you kind of focus on two quality cuts, you can. Um, there's quite a bit of, of matter there, and, and so currently we've fed that to our pigs. Um, we've also used it to create some kinds of um, earthworks around our garden in areas where cold air seems to kind of seem to come through and just to kind of create a bit of a visual break. So we use our compost in a different, our, our, our own matter in a different way. I believe that quality compost from someone whose job it is to make quality compost, that you can get a verified test back to when what is in that compost is more valuable to me than the amount of time that I'm going to spend trying to make an equivalent amount of compost. And and from a lean perspective, I've even gone to the point where I think that buying bags that are manageable by a human is probably a more efficient route than receiving a large quantity of compost that you are then going to individually shovel, double fold into some type of container to then take to the bed to then either dump or shovel back out. And so if I can bring in the amount of, of bales or bags per week per succession planting and know that there's a specific cost associated with planting um, and buying the amount of bags that I need per bed and then in basically precision applying that amount of compost or, or sphagnum peat moss to the bed, um, is just a, an easier system for me. I can take that from the truck directly to the bed and empty it across the bed. There's there's no additional steps in that process for me. Um, and so the use of, of, for me, because I'm right near Canada, and this is geographic and also contextual, the use of sphagnum peat moss for me, certified organic sphagnum peat moss from, from Canadian companies, reliable Canadian companies, in terms of covering my clay loamy soil that oftentimes is very moist. I've trialed without doing any of the broad forking, any of the raking, and nearly just layered on a quarter inch or a half inch of peat moss on top of my bed and run the cedar through it. And it's just enough stuff to soak up the moisture and not create that that clotting or chipping off of, of a wet soil. It, it's like the peat binds with the clay in an interesting way where it creates kind of a, a temporary tilt for you to be able to apply force to it without it, it chunking off. And so for me, it's just the consistency, the number of steps approach, and the results that I get, I, I, I buy in that media currently. Um, I do have a different plans for that compost though for, for next year, which is to make more of it, but more of it in a 
in, in the very first time. Nice. So, what? Maybe you mentioned it, but I missed it. Did you say which cedars you're using, or which cedar? Right. I use a single Jang. So, single Jang or JP, um, the standard uh, Jang, and I I push um, eight row. I do six and eight row for everything. Um, so all my baby greens are are eight. The other say longer season greens and root crops. So like chard would be um, six row, but all of the roots, radish, carrot, beef are all six row. And I push all of those my each line. Um, so for me, um, a given week is is six beds. Um, so I would do a, a bed of lettuce, a bed of mustard, a bed of baby kale, a bed of spinach, a, baby, a bed of arugula, and then I would kind of have like a combo bed where it would be beet greens um, or cat soy or something semi-seasonal, colorful, or if say there's larger demand growing in one crop or another, I'll do you know, for say 25 feet of something like that in, in that next 100 foot bed. Um, and so um, I, I use the system where I, I use a, a wooden keg that marks off every single bed that I have. So every single bed on both ends is marked off with a permanent peg. And that was the, probably the most revolutionary thing I've ever done on the farm. Uh, that makes it so the beds never move. It makes it so that you can run a string down the edge of that bed to broad fork, to run a rake, put your first line on your jang, and then every line on your jang subsequently follows immediately after that. And so I kind of, you know, feel like I've fairly mastered the single jang to be able to produce incredibly straight lines with very proficient results. Um, been very happy with it. So just so I understand, you have a wooden peg just pounded in at each end of your bed, and then you're tying a string and using that as a as a level of sorts. Yeah, so if I'm doing, like, my succession planting, um, I start on that far left edge of the six beds that have been all prepped, no-till, like we've described. So essentially you have six perfectly clean beds, not any weeds, and all six of those beds, as well as, say, Every single bed on the farm is pegged off on full side. So it's very clear where the paths are, where the beds are. And when I start, I take a line and I wrap it around the one end and I walk down to the other end and I wrap it around the peg. And then I pick up my jang and I run the jang right down the edge of that line. And that's my first line. And then when I turn around for baby greens, I'm running the jang not next to the furrow of that last line that was seated, but right on top of the furrow. So that the edge of your wheel should be running exactly on that line of your last row, if that makes sense. So if you're looking at the last row that you did, your your wheel should be essentially just right up against that line, that impression in the ground. And you run on top of that little bit of a furrow, if you will. You run on top of the furrow, not next to it. And I have a great result in getting eight very nice thin rows on a 30-inch bed. Um, I've, I've taken them to 12. Um, I'm just a little bit more of a fan on the eight. I think that I could do everything on six and have, like, a even easier time doing that first set of precision weeding. Um, because I think that this whole system, for me, definitely does rely on precision. And the difference say, between, like, precision weed and just weeding is that I'm able to run a specific tool down every single one of those lines every time with the intention of getting ahead of any weed before it really even emerges. And so I'm not out there with the tool going after weeds once they exist. I'm out there with the tool creating it so that they don't exist. And, and that's been absolutely necessary, is not letting a single plant go to the seed on, on the farm. What are you doing for path management? Um, okay, so um, upon emergence of, of the crop, and I'm going to say um, a real strong cotyledon, right, in, in the bed, 
Um, I do use the Johnny's blind sign rake down the bed. And after I do my first pass on blind sign, um, I use a hula ho and I just screw down a uh, path sort of like a, a Zen monk. Um, I, I, uh, I push and I pull and I take a step. And so it's kind of like this, uh, walking Zen down the path, but really quick and efficient. And I basically just, uh, hula ho the path. There's only one foot wide path. Um, and, uh, I just do that upon the first decision weeding of the bet. So I figure that that's about day seven or day ten. And then right before the canopy closes in again, I'm going to use a, a collinear hoe and I, I turn it sideways so it's only like the one inch wide and I drag that down every line. And then after doing that, I pull a hoe the path once more. And that's pretty much it until, say, first harvest. And then um, after first harvest, I have a series of, of steps to prepare the bed for a second harvest. And at that point in time, I hula ho again. So I hula ho the past probably three times on a uh, 40-day cycle. That's funny. I, I have the same feeling about hula hoeing the paths. And I find it more efficient than the wheel hoe, which ends up being kind of an awkward uh, use of muscles sometimes, depending on which wheel hoe you're using. Right. So, like, I, you know, not to just, like, totally get off tangent here, but I have this whole OCD kind of thing about the garden in it. And it's kind of like when you see the Zen monks raking their gravel gardens and they make the perfect impressions that you can see every little line and it's perfect for them, right? And so the garden to me is like that. It, when I feed, I love the fact that the Changwon leaves the impressions, the individual impressions in each bed. Like, I just feel like it's perfectly finished, right? And, and I mean, they have other functions, like they collect moisture and they kind of act as, like, interesting little mini furrows, but it's the same way when I do the, the pads. Like, I, I, I genuinely treat it like a Zen meditation where every, every push forward is, like, one step forward. And so when I'm done with the path and I look back, it, it's it's essentially perfect footprints, sideways, like sideways and diagonal footprints, because I take the same step every time into freshly cool soil. And so when I look back, it's like the bed has these perfect lines on it, and each path has like perfect footprints running down it. <laughs> like I can't help but feel satisfied at the end of doing something like that. Like it just. It feels so good to create that kind of physical. It's it's deeply satisfying. <laughs> I agree. I, I completely concur on that. I I think that all of this can seem sometimes ideological, right? Like, oh, you're no till because you think it's like a good idea or whatever, right? And it's some kind of badge that you can wear. But I I genuinely use the no till practices that I described in that series of steps. Because to me, it's the most efficient series of steps that I can engage in on my farm on a human scale uh, without having to rely on large mechanization. So to me, when I look at what the total you know, cost of, say, a tractor and maintenance is and fuel and all of that, I feel like I can buy a whole bunch of compost for a really long time, right? And that I'm constantly, say, making those input purchases off of funds that I currently have. I'm not going in debt to have equipment that sits for a majority of the time. Um, and so to me, it, it, it financially makes sense. Um, logistically, it, it makes sense um, for me to do so. And then I think just the, the results that you receive, uh, you know, I mean, you've been putting it into practice, it, it's just that you see your soil start to really be healthy in a way like it constantly kind of surprises you. Like when I pull carrots out of the ground by hand and I don't use a digging fork to do it 
and like around each carrot, there's like all these worms, and you know, it's just amazing what you see happen to the soil life. So, one thing is by leaving the roots intact, by not disturbing the rhizosphere, and just merely putting a, a like a compost layer or a litter layer on top, your your next seed is germinating directly into that active rhizosphere. It hasn't been pulled apart. It's not trying to repair itself. It's already right there. And and that next plant going in can follow all of those root corridors half right in. It's going to be immediately colonized by all of the fungi. So to me, you're you're basically not sending yourself back by going no to um, I always kind of joke around, which is like a tractor doesn't create fertility, right? Like it's just so I can do this other step and get a clean seed bed that actually adds fertility in the compost, in the organic matter that I'm putting onto the bed. So by creating a clean bed, I'm adding fertility. Or in the other step, I'm creating a clean bed, but I'm not actually adding fertility. I'm reducing fertility by doing so. And so it's it's kind of an interesting this comparison that right there in and of itself. The other thing that I think about when I talk about clearing the, the bed from organic matter and putting it to the compost pile is that when you put down a lot of fresh live organic matter into your soil, it has to go through immobilization before it's going to be remineralized. And what that means is, this is where you hear, hear the term lock. And so what it means is that all of the bacteria and fungi are going to use the available nutrients in your soil to start the decomposition process of that organic matter in your bed. And so all of the available nutrients are going to be held up inside the microbiology during the time period. And that's when you're putting your plant into the ground. And so unless you're actually waiting a long enough time period for all of that organic matter to break down before you plant in, you're putting a plant into an immobile situation. When you put a plant into an immobile situation, oftentimes you're going to probably want to apply more fertilizer than necessary because you see that your plant isn't growing or isn't healthy. And that's yeah. in simply because your your bed is just locked out. And so when you actually clear that residue or that organic matter and then you compost it and you compost it well, then when you put that compost back on, you're not just putting that raw organic matter that needs to be decomposed before it's valuable to you in the bed. You're actually putting on organic matter that is decomposed and is available to your plant. So when we see a lot of people like turning over beds really fast with rototillers and things, like oftentimes I'm kind of wondering whether or not there's like a lot of soil testing going on or if they're just maybe applying you know, fertilizer without a soil test because they just know that, like, putting, you know, bone meal down or blood meal down helps decompose that organic matter. But sometimes I kind of sit back and I I wonder about that because if you're tarping afterwards, you are allowing that bed to totally decompose that organic matter before, say, going back in. So this, for me, is a way to not have to wait, say, that two-week period for that organic matter to really fully break down before going back in because I have such a small farm. I'm trying to basically, like, harvest, clear the bed, prepare the bed, and be back in that bed in in 24 hours. Um, and so, you know, just being conscious of where your soil's at, how fast does it actually decompose things, where is your bed, you know, after the fact that it has decomposed these various crops. Um, you know, if you're deficient in a particular thing and you put in a lot of deficient things, you're compounding the deficiency. And so unless you're really on top of where your soil is at, by putting in that organic matter and a lot of it, you're really only just putting in what was, you're stacking the problem, right? You're not addressing the problem. And so to me, again, this version of, of no-till really addresses those uh, soil management issues for me at the same time. Um, and so at the end of every year, I should say, at the end of every single year, we do pull large silage tarps. So a farmer's friend, 40, sometimes 50 foot wide by 100 foot long silage tarps. 
and we pull that over the entire farm, over everything that's not. And usually I try and have that planned out so that the first beds that I'm going to be planting into in spring are covered and at least give myself, say, the five week, five, say, 30 beds um, until you run into what was over winter. So that regardless of how the spring is, I can at least get five weeks and get that overwintered crop out before I'm into those beds. Where are you getting your soil tests, and where do you recommend people looking for them? Okay, so we're fortunate that there's a really good extension service here in Spokane through um, Wester, or sorry, through um, Washington State University. Uh, Washington State University is a pretty renowned agricultural school, and so they have pretty decent um, extension offices. So if you have a good extension office in your area through your ag school, ag university in the in the region, they usually offer pretty basic soil tests. Nothing going to be like twenty five, thirty five dollars. And usually I think that that's probably going to be what's called a Malix three. And and a Malix three is going to tell you what's in your soil. It's not going to tell you what's available. It's tell you what's in your soil. And so then you can get a what's sometimes called a taste test. And the taste test is going to then tell you what's actually available to your plant at that point in time. And so, you know, sometimes you're going to need to find a different lab to do that. So Logan Labs, that's L-O-G-A-N, Logan Labs. Logan Labs has come my way as being the, the most long-standing professional agricultural soil testing facility. I, I think it's like one of the most known uh, soil testing facilities. Um, and so they will do a combination for you, uh, a male three and a paste. They can also do your water, which is important because you need to know how much safe free calcium you have in your water because if you're just pouring out free calcium, you need to know that. Um, and so then you can have your water tested along with getting a male and a paste. And so then from there, they're going to give you a really kind of basic, like, we think you should be in this range here, here, and they won't necessarily give you the information, say, how to go from where you are to what range they suggest, but they will at least tell you that they think that you're following, say, this certain parameters. Now, the parameters that they're describing are going to as far as I understand it, are coming from, from an Albrecht perspective on balancing soil minerals. So if you don't know about cation exchange capacity or how your soil colloid works or what cations are versus anions, then that's a whole other conversation. But the, the, the basic of it is that you're trying to balance the minerals that are bonded to your soil particles in a specific way. And usually what that means is sort of like dealing with your cations and not your anions. So you're dealing with things like your calcium, not things like your nitrogen. Um, and so that's sort of what I use that information for. Now, there's a guy by the name of Ad Putty. He runs a company called Keep It Simple Organic. Um, he's located uh, in the Seattle area, and he has um, what I consider to be a very amazing offer and or product, which is that you purchase the Logan Labs test through him. He sends you a sample kit that you fill with your soil sample and a prepaid envelope to Logan Labs. Um, and then the results are sent to him, and he is a soil scientist, a soil professional, a soil management professional. Um, he has his own line of soils that he makes. He has a nursery that he operates. His family has been in the nursery business for quite some time. And has, as far as I'm concerned, one of the, the better grasp on contemporary soil science that I've ever come across personally, um, and he's linked up with another individual who has 
a keen understanding of the Albrecht perspective of soil mineral balancing. And between the two of them, they give you their recommendation back based upon what they believe to be a proper soil balance. And we'll then even source and mix the amendment based upon your definition of soil volume or square footage or area um, and be able to provide provide good quality inputs, organic, certified organic inputs um, based upon that soil test. And, and so that's the service that I use because as far as I'm concerned, being able to have a professional um, give you that level of consultation in regards to your mineral amendments, not say the, the physical side of amending your soil, but the, the, the chemistry side of amending your soil is just invaluable. Um, if you're not testing, you're guessing. If you're guessing, you're going to get it wrong because you're not as smart as soil. And if you can save money because you don't need anything, well, then you save money and you didn't need it. If you balance your soil correctly, you really only are going to need to lightly amend thereafter because the whole point of, of overloading the soil colloid, as sometimes it's talked about, is that you're basically pushing the elemental bond within your soil to the maximum holding capacity. So everything's at the end of the day in a non woo sense, a positive and a negative charge. And the positive and the negative is bond. And so things like calcium bonds to the soil colloid, while things like nitrogen don't bond and are in a free state. And that's why I say nitrogen reaches while calcium doesn't. And so the idea being is that your soil is a sponge, and so what you want to do is you want to have as many of those bonds take place as possible. What that means is that your soil is fully saturated. It never hold any more mineral content, even if you wanted it to. And so that means that any time a plant is asking for any specific type of mineral, it's, it's available in full. And so the point of the balance part is not just that you have the maximum amount of everything there. It's that you have specific ratios of certain minerals to other kinds of minerals. because there really aren't things called efficiencies at the end of the day. There's really just imbalance. And that too much of one thing blocks out the other thing, and too little of one thing interferes with the ability to grab other things. And so this perspective just tries to balance it all. Um, the results being that your plants are healthier, and a healthy plant resists death, and a healthy plant has better flavor. Um, you have higher success rates, and so your yield is higher. Um, and overall, the results sort of speak for themselves. Um, once, you, once you properly balance your, your soil colloid, um, you pretty much don't have any other fertility issues. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's a really fascinating... It's one thing that I, I, I think that I've always enjoyed in our correspondences is, is, is your sort of... Um, appreciation and adherence to the science and I find in talking to a lot of no-till people that um, the science often leads them in the direction of not tillage you know we all know tillage is <laughs> what it does to soil but also when you start looking into uh, how soil functions then then tillage seems like the last thing you'd want to do it, it really does and and I think that there's just a moment and that, when, okay, like when you really look back at the history of agriculture, right, human beings engaged in agriculture, tillage is like this really small little blip in it. Like the Mulbore plow was invented in the 18th century, right? So like that was just a couple hundred years ago, all right? So like the other 9,000 years of agriculture was essentially all no-till. I think like some of the highest forms of technology were like a, a stick that you would poke in the ground and you would drop seeds in and then you would like cover it with your foot, right? 
And, and so most of the time, we just had no tool to break open the ground. We didn't have, like, big sheets of polymer to lay flat that would kill off the vegetation over, like, a whole year. Like, we didn't, we didn't have those things. So once, like, the mobile plow was invented, it just seemed like that all this toil, you know, had been solved. And to a certain extent, it, it's, not, it's not wrong, right? It, it totally did recreate the ability for humans to feed themselves. But you see, obviously, with the mass scale problem with that is you get the dust bowl and you get, you know, a dead gulf of Mexico, um, you know, that's not going to be sustainable. And, and so the alternatives that arose to tillage were chemical no-till. And, and so sometimes when I say no-till and I'm around grain guys, they kind of look at me like, you know, Ugh. like, what are you talking about? That means that you're pouring glyphosate on everything. And so the only version of no-till until, say, whatever we're talking about came about, like, in the past, what, 20 years? I mean, it's like permaculture is 1982, um, Elliot Coleman's, you know, kind of inventing a filter in, like, what, 2000? You know, it's like only in the past five years has harping really become prominent at, like, we're talking like brand new territory here in terms of agricultural interaction with soil. Like it's, it is brand new. I, you know, it's like you got chemical no-till in, in say, 1950. Uh, no-till farming, the book No-Till Farming was written in 1973, but was fully chemical no-till. So, you know, like killing is just what you do. It's not like you, you, you don't, you rarely stop the question. It's kind of like, just what farming. And and I think that what's so interesting, say, about the lean perspective, or when you read Ben Hartman's book, he, he lists out the things that are waste on the farm, right? The actions that are waste on the farm. And I would say that all of those things on that list is what someone would respond to. They would say that those were what farming was, right? Weeding, right? Weeding is farming, right? Like, killing is farming, okay? But, but, like, at the end of the day, those aren't the things that you should be even spending your time doing anyway, right? Um, the Edward Faulkner wrote The Plowman's Fault in 1943, right? And here's, a, here's some quotes. No one has ever advanced the scientific reasons for plowing. There is simply no need for plowing in the first instance. And most of the operations that customarily follow are entirely unnecessary the land had not first been plowed. There is nothing wrong with our soil except our interference. And it can be said with considerable truth that the use of the plow has actually destroyed the productiveness of our soil. And that was in 1940. Right? So, you know, to me, it's just like we're in this momentum. And honestly, only this year did I ever really finally boil it down to that that distinction of, of that there's crop residue above ground and that there's roots in the soil and that the goal is to not brew with the soil, right? Like, if somebody asked you to go mow the lawn and you went out and you just killed it, right, they'd be like, what are you doing, right? And you'd be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm turning in all of the grass into the yard so that they don't so that there won't be grass anymore, right? Like, it would just seem foolish. You're like, no, you need to cut that back. Cut it back, not, not the ground. So it's, it's kind of just coming to a realization that, that there is a, a, different, a different way. And, you know, um, at the end of the day, like, it's just so much easier. And once you have a series of steps to do, you, you don't have to reinvent it anymore. You know, like, it took a long time just for me to know, like, do I, do I put the amendment down first or do I broad for it? And one reason why I put the amendment down after broad for it, that way some of that amendment actually falls down the track. It's a little bit deeper into the right, right? So that because I am not, say, deeply mixing in, you know, like my kelp and my alfalfa or whatever, it, it's just a little bit 
gets in. And, and that was just sort of like, okay, this makes sense to put this step before that happened. So it's always being refined. Um, and, and I think that at this point in time, what needs to be developed is the no-till tool so that you actually have a device that runs down the bed that's 30 inches wide and that cuts right at soil surface. It's not just lightly scratching like a quarter of an inch below. Like I can imagine like a modified harvest star, you know, one of those like walk behind baby green cutters. Right. You know, like it, it would just remove the, the organic matter from the surface and collect it for you very conveniently. Because then after that, all that you're doing is just applying a small amount of compost on top and you have a perfectly clean bed that you can transplant or or seed directly into. And it's because no one farms this way that that tool does. Right? Like, I've thought about just giving a second quick cut harvester that I'm kind of brutal with or, you know, that's why I've gone to the, the spin trimmer with the rigid blade so there's not a bunch of splatter. That way I can just kind of cut from one side to another and just kind of just barely lightly skim across the surface of the soil by doing so. And, and that's the best tool that I've come up with so far. Because, to be perfectly honest, I was doing this by I cut or pulled every single plant by hand. Right? And I know that that's not There has to be some, you know, some level of clearing the bed. And I think that that's just, at the end of the day, why people come to us, because it seems like it's more work. But when I looked at how many times I would run the rototiller back and forth down the bed and then, like, break up the debris on the surface and try and reform it and, you know, all that stuff, at the end of the day, I realized, like, it might seem like more work being cutting, you know, all of these plants by hand right at the, the soil surface. But I honestly ask if, if it, you know, I really timed myself. Um, it's just a perception, I think. Yeah, it's so interesting just thinking about it in the perspective of of history with the, with this, like you were saying. I mean, it is it feels like a brand new style of farming in a very ridiculous way because, yeah, it had to be the only style of farming before. But... Um, but it's, you know, it's more about production now and not just sustenance. But, yeah, I mean, the tools are going to start coming along and then the access to the information is is coming along. Um, I know there are a couple books going to come out here soon that are going to be, that that could have a lot of potential. Um, and and I think, yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool to sit on this sort of precipice of, of the paradigm shift from the tillage paradigm to possibly the, you know, the non-tillage paradigm, the, the biological paradigm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I am constantly amazed um, to think that this style of farming is new. I, you know, we, I, we kind of joke around sometimes where we're like, yeah, farming was invented in like 2013. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I feel like that. Like, I feel like the tools and, and like how... I don't know what happened over the past like five, ten years with, with the amount of information um, available on the internet, especially within the agricultural sphere to just be. Like, I feel like farmers used to hold their cards really close to their chest, you know, like how you got the good crop, or what variety you use. Ever. Now it's crazy open source. I mean, we, we, we have a joke where we're like, if there's a problem that we're facing, we just wait. And let the internet solve it for us, um, because like you know, in a matter of like four or five months, if you pay attention, you'll be like, oh, there's the answer. Like I just came up with the answer, you know, and, and you can quickly apply it. And um, you know, it, it's fascinating to me because I definitely see the potential of um, small scale operations like this really being the viable model. Um, you know, it's, it's it's absolutely amazing how this product can be pulled off of such a small square footage that's operated this way. Um, you know, we we harvest about 250, 300 pounds of baby leaf a week. Um, you know, 100 pounds of root crops. 
and you know, in season with the tomatoes, uh, 7,500 pounds of tomatoes a week. Um, and we market them in really specific ways. And so, you know, you can add a lot of value, just an incredible amount of value out of a small space. And I know my inefficiency. It's, it's incredible to think that you can not use chemicals, not use fossil fuel, have erosion, not have weeds, and have your farm be a quarter of an acre and have it generate more revenue and, I mean, dare I say, profit than most large scale farming operations that you know exist on the, the say the individual ownership level. Um, I mean to me it's the way. It's the way. There's just there's no other way. <laughs> I think that's a good place to uh turn to our sort of closing ceremony here and we'll do a little rapid fire questions and uh and then I'll I'll let you go. We uh all right, who's your favorite farmer or farm right now? Ah, oh, well, favorite farm right now is just obviously never think. I mean, I mean, like, what are you going to say? Like, you know, the, the dude crushes it. And, um, you know, going into tool development and all of that, you know, like, I don't know what kind of trick more drank, but I want Dude, those tools, I, I'm, I'm yeah, de- I mean, yeah, it's just silly, you know. And, and again, how like I think that the most amazing things are the ones that people just would easily accept as like if you took an outsider and you were like, oh, look at this farm. You like, don't you think that it's amazing? They would be like, well, yeah. Like, isn't this how everyone farms? Like, why wouldn't you farm like, that? right? You know, they would just be like. Yeah, no doubt. You know, oh, oh, you don't sell and you just like, you know, transplant, you know, in and you clear the crop residue? Like, well, duh. And what, what else have you been doing? What else have you idiots been doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I kind of feel about, like, those moments of truth, you know? Like, I don't know, when you, when you see, like, the photographs of your home and you're just like, good God, like Jeremy Mueller is some kind of you know, baby greens, God. Yeah. And and when anybody would look at that, they would just be like, well, yeah, I mean, this makes total sense. Like, he's got those <laughs> tools, he's just, you know, like, duh. You know, and, and I, that truth, I think, that just shines from, from those types of, of people is certainly motivation for us. What's your favorite farming book? Um, I would have to say The Good Life uh, from... The Nearings was probably the most fundamental farming book that I ever read before I was farming. Um, you know, I think that there's some amazing wisdom in there. And I didn't even know that Elliot Coleman had bought or was given land from Scott Nearing, which was where his farm was in, um, in Maine. I didn't know that until much later. And I... I think that that was amazing because at the time, Elliot Coleman, you know, I mean, he's the godfather. So any Elliot Coleman book, obviously. Um, the Griswold book, the farm financing Griswold book, uh, organic farm finance. I, just, I don't know what the name of it is, but Griswold. You know what book I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, that um, in terms of laying out, like, the perception that Every crop is independent, and every crop has its own cost, and you need to be analyzing every crop independent of every other crop in order to know what's profitable and what's not profitable, I think is a, was one of those really eye-opening things in farming. What's your best advice for a young farmer? Know what broccoli is before you start to farm. Um, I, I see a lot of people... No offense to people who are trying to, like, bring a lot of farmers to be farmers. I just think that if you don't, like, garden or eat food, um, start eating food and garden. I think, like, uh, you really need to be deeply embedded in 
an understanding of what food is, the history of food, what soil is. Do you, have you seen these plants grow two, three, four times before? Because, you know, if you just go out there and you start a farm and you don't even know what a tomato plant is supposed to look like, I, I think that, you know, do a little self-investment first. Uh, that's my, my best advice. I guess the next thing is if you're actually going to build a farm, uh, build a farm first before you think that you're supposed to sell produce and work a job or work on a farm while you build your farm. So make sure that you have everything in place before you start to try and grow plants because growing plants is a full-time job in and of itself, not building a farm while you're trying to grow plants that you've never grown before. Well, man, we're going to have to do this again, Alex. Yeah, please, please. Uh, always, always a pleasure to um, ramble on about things that I feel I know. <laughs> well, nice, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. All right, if you liked Alex, make sure to follow he and Amy on places like Instagram. All the relevant links will be in the show notes. Also, check out the Patreon page for this show. Also, also, follow me at Rough Draft Jesse on Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to email me some content suggestions at farmerjessefrost at gmail.com. Uh, make sure to subscribe to it wherever you're getting it, the podcast that is. Um, if you can, you should be able to shortly. Let me know if you have issues. And... I will send you off with our no-till fact of the day brought to you by the Worm Farmer's Handbook by Rhonda Sherman. There are over 9,000 species of worms, ranging from half inch to 22 feet long. Yeah, feet. I, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, this is another good reason not to till. That thing would be a mess to get out of the tines. Anyway, all right. Later, y'all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>